Good morning. morning. We're all awake now. Great. Um, I'll pray in just a second, but I want to look back a little bit on what we talked about last week. So last week we saw the relationship that Nehemiah had to his ultimate leader, which we know is God. But, and how God um, or how Nehemiah responded to what God put on his heart. We also learned that unless our relationship with the Lord isn't right, first and foremost, that the final analysis is grim. We saw wonderful leadership qualities in Nehemiah last week. We saw that a great leader knows how to prioritize. And I wanted to remind you last week and again this week, we are all leaders in the kingdom of God, whether it's in our families, our churches, or our community. And our witness to the people around us matters. They're watching how we're living out our lives. And they're also watching how we prioritize what we find or what we think is a priority in our life. Is what you, prior, is what you prioritize representing Christ well? Do the things that you prioritize. Reflect the importance of Christ in your life. And would other people agree with that? One of Nehemiah's top priorities, as we learned last week, was prayer. Um, And we saw that in our lesson last week, and we're going to see it in our lesson this week. We also saw that a great leader is somebody who, who is humble, and they know that they can fall to sin just like anybody else. And a great leader perseveres. Um, Nehemiah is going to get to exercise a whole lot of perseverance, not just this week. This is just the beginning, but in the chapters to come as well. And we also talked about the acrostic of a. That God would use that to draw you in and give you some structure to your prayer life. In fact, I've been praying that if you've been woken up early or you can't go to sleep at night, that's because I'm praying for that. So I want you to really cultivate a deeper prayer life. Don't throw anything at me. And then finally, we saw how Nehemiah is an archetype of Christ. And I have to tell you all, that was like my favorite part. Um, Like Christ, he was willing to eat and to drink possibly uh, poison that was given to the king. And we know that Christ didn't let the cup of God's wrath pass, and he drank it to the dredges for us, for our sin. He absorbed our sin. In exchange, he gave us his righteousness. And in my time as I was praying too, I know that not everybody in here knows that as a reality. And if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, please talk to one of us. Um, Ask us to go out to lunch or coffee if you want to talk more about that. So let me go ahead and pray before we get started. Oh, Father, as I come before you this morning, Lord, this, this chapter, there's so much in it, Lord. Thank you for the example that Nehemiah sets for us. Thank you for his leadership skills, but more than anything, Lord, the way he depended upon you. I thank you for every woman that's here this morning, and I know some probably came with great difficulty. Maybe some are not feeling 100%, and I know the enemy just throws out every obstacle possible to keep them from getting here. So, Lord, I just pray your blessing over each woman that's here this morning. I pray that you would teach us something from your word, that we're able to apply it, Lord, And then we're able to share it with others, all for your glory. In your precious name, amen. So this week, we're going to see how Nehemiah has a shift, because now he's going to be going from his ultimate leader, which is God, to his earthly leader, which is King uh, Artaxerxes, and then how he relates to him And then how he relates to the people that he's going to be leading once he gets to Jerusalem. We could say that Nehemiah was pretty much in a position of middle management here. We don't all work outside the home, but we do all report to God. And last week, we ended up with um, seeing that Nehemiah was weeping and he was praying over the ruins of Jerusalem. He was begging God to lead him in a plan of recovery for these people. 
I would imagine, too, that since Nehemiah was praying and asking God for help, he's also anticipating that God was going to answer. He's seeking God, but he knows that God's going to answer because if you remember, he tells us and he's praying that God is attentive to his prayers, that his ears hear and his eyes see what's going on. We worship and we pray to God because we know the same is true for us. He hears us, he sees us, and he answers our prayers. Now, if you'll go ahead and open your Bibles with me to chapter two, we're gonna look at those first two verses, or first 10 verses, excuse me. And remember that as we're reading this, we're reading Nehemiah's memoirs about what's going on. So let me read for us in verses one through three. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And Matthew, my iPad is not doing its thing. Sorry, they're having some issues this morning. And then he goes on to say, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when my ancestors, when the, sorry, uh, look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? We talked about this last week. So there's been about a four to five month lapse here from the time that he learned about what was going on in Jerusalem, he spent time in prayer, and then the time that he got there. So it's been a good while um, before he comes before King Artaxerxes with what's on his heart. And we know though that he's before the king every single day because he's his cupbearer. And so far he had not um, let down his guard and allowed the king to see his face. Now the text doesn't tell us exactly um, why it took him a while, but we can assume that he's continuing to pray and seek God and he's waiting on God to answer. He's waiting for that green light. Ladies, this is what we call active waiting. We're not doing nothing. We're praying and seeking the Lord. And we'll see um, in the next chapter, Uh, or later in the chapter, just all the planning that went into place, but the prayer, it began with prayer. So he's waiting for the right time to approach the king. He was a wise man and waited on God. One thing to note uh, too, is that Nehemiah didn't have any power at all. And the kings of Persia, those uh, kings were known to be very impossible people to deal with. They could be very cruel and mean. Whatever they said was the law. Um, Very oppressive kings. And the people resented them. And this in turn is what happened lots of times with the king while they were poisoned or assassinated was because the people resented them so much. And remember, that was the only way that a king could be disposed is, you know, to be poisoned or assassinated. And these kings were suspicious of everybody and everything. And then, of course, the fear factors at play. And people of that day were not allowed to be in the presence of the king with a long face. The king had jokers and jesters and things to have them laughing all the time. They really didn't live much of a world of reality. Um, And Nehemiah, being the cupbearer, if the king saw a long face on him, he could assume a whole lot of things. He could read a lot into that. He could be thinking, hmm, is my cupbearer about to keel over because somebody just poisoned him? Maybe he drank some bad wine or ate some bad food. Uh, Did he just receive some bad news that he's not telling me about? So Nehemiah was not only fearful about his job and being sad in front of the king, he was fearful because he could have literally lost his head for being, having that long, sad face. So there were lots of things um, that were going on. But notice that he didn't say he was afraid. He said he was very afraid. And then Nehemiah goes on to say, may the king live forever. And by the way, king, you look awesome today. I hope you live for a long time. Now, you might read that and go, well, he's still a little brown nosing, isn't he? A little boot licking with that king. But actually, I think you read in your study guide that this was a way that 
was uh, common in that day, the way that they approached the king. And did you notice that Nehemiah answered the king's question with a question? He said in verse three, well, why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Nehemiah was very tactful in the way that he told the king the source of his sadness, which is another great uh, leadership quality. He was a very tactful man. He presented his long face as a personal and not a political matter. He knew that the... the request that he was going to make to the king would require a reversal of a uh, law that he had put in place, a former policy that we learn about in Ezra chapter 4. And that's where a group of officials came to the king and they said, um, these people, these Jewish people, they're scheming against us and they're doing all this so that they can rebel and they don't have to pay taxes and tributes. And the king, and they told the king, hey, go look, go look in the archives. You're going to see it's true. He did, and that's when he, um, t- and that's when he stopped the building that was going on at that time. He agreed. However, by presenting this as a personal matter to the king, he was appealing to the king on a personal level because he cared about his city and he cared about his ancestors too. Note that he never mentioned Jerusalem by name. Now that he's got the king's attention and he's kind of stirred his heart, then he says, the king says to him, well, what do you want? There it is. That is the opportunity that he is waiting for, the opportunity that he's been praying for months for. Have you ever walked into your boss's office and you've asked for a raise and then you get one and it's more than you ever thought it would be? You're like, All that praying, wow, this is paid off. Or you're asking somebody for just some big favor. You know, you get really nervous. And I was thinking about Nehemiah. Don't you know he's standing there and his palms are sweating and his heart is pounding so loud that he thinks that everybody else can hear it around him? Have you ever had anything happen to you like that? I know I have. And then he just blurts out what he wants, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. Again, we see Nehemiah praying. Oh, this one, does this one stand up? Well, you know, I'm the techiest person alive. I can't even get the iPad. Okay, it doesn't. Okay. Let's see if the clicker works. Oh, there it is. Matthew, are you probably helping me or did it? No, I touched it. So I think. I would say, geez, it's bad. (laughs) Don't tell my kids. Okay. Um, But no, what we see Nehemiah doing is we see him shooting up an arrow prayer. It's one of those prayers that you kind of say under your breath that nobody else really hears. Then he says, I prayed to the God of heaven. Look with me at verse five. It says, and then he answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah. Again, not mentioning the name Jerusalem, where my ancestors are appealing to him on that personal level and where they're buried so that I can rebuild it. Have you ever had a personal experience like that? You have been praying like crazy for something and then before you know it, it's right there in front of you. And you're thinking, oh great, Now, what do I do? Here it is. You send up an arrow prayer. Arrow prayers, ladies, are great, but I also want you to see that those arrow prayers, that arrow prayer that Nehemiah just prayed had been rooted in long prayers for many months. It rested on extensive praying. He knows that he needs God's help first and foremost before he can go to the king and get the things that he needs to rebuild the city that God put on his heart. And the fact that the king really cared genuinely about Nehemiah and his long face and what was going on tells us a lot about who Nehemiah is. He was obviously a trusted man, a man of integrity, and he proved himself to be that. He was above suspicion, so the king was able to say, okay, what's going on with you? 
Nehemiah also immediately senses that this is the opportunity he's been waiting for, that God is opening that door. So he asks the king for what he wants, to allow him to return to the city of Judah where his ancestors are. And just like that, don't you know, he just kind of exhaled. There it is, I got it out. So the crazy part about this is this very same king is the one that stopped the work the last time. But Nehemiah was able to convince the king to reverse his very own policy. But who do we know actually did that? Who reversed that? We remember that from Proverbs last week. Isn't it amazing, though, when you come before the Lord and you pray that he can soften the hearts of the most difficult people that you deal with just by spending time with him and asking him for it? And that's a lesson to us. Let's talk to God before we talk to those difficult people in our lives. Now, Nehemiah's past uh, track record was really important too. It was important for his future success and what he was doing. He knew he needed the king's help to accomplish all that God laid on his heart. Okay, look at verse six. So then the king with the queen sitting beside him Ask, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. So it's obvious the king is warming up to the idea, warming up to Nehemiah because he's asking him more questions. How long will it take and when will you return? And one thing that I don't want you to miss here is that it mentions that the queen is sitting beside him Uh, sitting beside King Artaxerxes. And if you were able to read the book of Esther, this may have given you kind of a clue. Uh, Commentators argue about this though. Was it Queen Esther or was Queen Esther the mother-in-law here? We know that Queen Esther was a Jewess and she was very interested in restoring the site of Jerusalem because these were her people. So like I said, some believe it was actually her and others believe um, that it was the mother-in-law of the queen. So whatever it is, though, we know that Esther had an influence here. And maybe it was her influence on King Artaxerxes that made him favorably disposed towards Nehemiah. And what's that saying? What's that saying? Behind every great man. Y'all can't finish that? Come on, we got a room full of women. It's y'all behind every great man. But one thing that's not evident here is he said, so he set a time and we'll learn later on that was actually 12 years that he was gone. And it says that he pleased the king. It pleased the king to let him go. So now Nehemiah is gonna ask for the whole enchilada. He says here, if you look at verses seven through nine, I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, king of the royal park, so that he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for my own residence? And because the gracious hand of God uh, was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king also sent an army and cavalry with me. I imagine he thought over and over in his mind exactly what he was gonna ask for, given the opportunity. And sometimes if you ask for something, you just see this total green light and you're like, well, let me ask for one more thing. And you know, oh, oh, can I have this too? It's kind of like... Well, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, the other thing I want to point out, I'm getting ahead of myself, and this is a quote, ladies, that I love. A goal without a plan is a wish. And Nehemiah was not only praying, he had a goal in mind and he was planning. No doubt he thought long and hard how he was going to rebuild those walls. I need a drink of water. So as I'm studying and reading this chapter, what comes to mind is years ago, I saw Priscilla Shire and she gave a great visual demonstration of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. 
And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but I'm going to do that. But I'm going to give you the short version. Let me scroll over one more, Matthew, to the Ephesians verse. Thank you. Okay, so this is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 lived out in Nehemiah. The passage, um, let's see. So it reads, Now to him, the God of heaven, who is able, Nehemiah knew that without God, nothing would be accomplished. To do, move the heart of the king, to do immeasurably more, give him letters to the governors for safe travel, letters for the timber from the royal forest, for the gates and his personal residence, more than we can ask or imagine an army escort with cavalry that he didn't even ask for, according to his power, with God, all things are possible. That is at work within us, the Holy Spirit gives us power. To him, the God of heaven, whose gracious hand was all over them, be glory to God, be glory in the church and Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Nehemiah is living out this verse. He comes in with a long face and before you know it, the king is financing the entire project. That's God. Talk about God's provision. Why would a pagan king give his top guy 12 years to, to leave um, his top security guy, his advisor, the closest man to the king, he gave him 12 years to go back and to rebuild the walls that had been broken down. And not only that, Israel or uh, Jerusalem, they were actually an enemy to them, all because of the gracious hand of God. It made me think of, have you ever taken your kids to the mall because they need a pair of pants? And before you know it, you leave, they have a pair of pants, they have a shirt, they have a scarf, they have a hat, new shoes, new socks. They get the whole enchilada. So they're appealing to their mamas. Okay, remembering that we're all leaders, how are we gonna apply what we're learning here? Nehemiah was a loyal servant to the king. If we can't be loyal to those that we serve, those that we work with, those that we're on committees on or teams or whatever, then we need to move on if we can't be loyal to the people that we serve with or work for. Nehemiah was a man of great tact. He presented his desires with, as a personal issue versus a political one. He never mentioned Jerusalem because he knew that to ask for the king to rebuild a fortified city would make the king suspicious. He was also an honest man. Remember, we're reading his diary and he was very honest and transparent when he said, I was very afraid. He's a man of prayer and we saw that modeled in chapter one and we see it again here. But that also gives us insight into this man's personal life. His devotion to God was uh, um, important and it was a daily discipline of his life. He was a great planner. He had a fixed goal in mind and he worked to achieve it. James Boyce says, unless someone has a clear understanding of what they're trying to do and why it's important, other important but lesser matters will crowd in to chase the proper goals out. This is important with you and your personal goals, whether it's with your family, your finances, or your marriage. And last and certainly not least, he depended on God. Dependence on God, though, does not eliminate planning any more than it eliminates hard work. While he was planning, he was praying. When Nehemiah had done everything that he could possibly do to achieve success, he acknowledged that it had come about because of the gracious hand of God. And this, ladies, is the difference between a Christian worldview and a secular worldview. Warren Wearsby points out the difference, too, between the earthly king that Nehemiah was serving and the king of kings. Nehemiah had to wait for an invitation before he could share his burden with Artaxerxes. People had to be very cautious when approaching the kings in those days. 
But we can come before the throne of grace any time with any need or any burden that we have. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Artaxerxes saw the sorrow on Nehemiah's face, but the Lord already knows the sorrows of our heart and he feels them right along with us. We're never sure of the mood of a human leader, but we can always be sure of God's loving arms that are ready and willing to welcome us in. Nehemiah knew his success was because of God's grace. And in verse eight, B, it says, and because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my success or my request. All glory to God. Next, though, we see the opposition enter. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that somebody had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. These troublemakers we'll see in um, the coming chapters and later in this chapter. So Nehemiah had been praying. He got the green light from God. He seized the moment to ask Artaxerxes what he needed. God opened the door wide, but now he has to face the reality and put those plans into action. So this is where he steps out in faith to make the journey to Jerusalem. Look at your Bibles with me at verses 11 and 12. It says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few good men. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. What's the first thing Nehemiah did when he got to Jerusalem? It says that he waited. He didn't rush into things. He was wise. He had been traveling for months, a thousand miles. He was probably experiencing what we would call jet lag. I imagine he would be hangry um, like I am after a long trip. We're not told exactly what he was doing, but it's a pretty good bet that during those three days, he was probably resting in the Lord, planning and praying about how to approach these people and accomplish this plan. So after three days, he sets out to examine the, examine the extent of the destruction in Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah was the leader, and he had to methodically approach the people there uh, with the task that ahead and lead the people to begin the work. First, he works with a pagan king, but now it's totally different. He's working with a group of demoralized people who are in disgrace. The Jews in Jerusalem, they believed in God, but I don't think they felt at this time that God was really with them. They um, felt rejected. They probably lost hope and wondered, where is God in the situation that we find ourselves in? And before he was ready to tell anybody about his plans, he wanted to see everything for himself. It says in verse 13, by night, let's see, By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal wall and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as of yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Evidently, there was so much rubble, he had to get off of his horse and walk around. It says that he examined the walls and the gates. The Jews, the priests, the nobles had no idea what he was doing. And don't you know, while he's walking around, he's saying, oh, Lord, this is worse than I thought. Now, commentators differ on, um, if you want to look on, I think it's on page 127 in your study guide, you can kind of see the diagram. You looked at it while you were um, doing your lesson. They debate on kind of the circumference of this city. They estimate that it was between one and a half to two miles. 
And what we, he doesn't say too much about that I've read is that the destruction was great. The stones were massive and that they had actually fallen down into the valley at some point, uh, some points around the wall. And we need to remember, ladies, this is not like some garden fence or brick, you know, little brick wall that we're used to. The, stone, the walls were actually 10 feet thick and 12 feet high. No wonder the people were thinking, this is just overwhelming. There's no way. But watch how wisely Nehemiah chooses his words when he turned to those who were waiting. Then he said, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God, gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said. Anyone, leadership or not, should choose their words wisely if they want to motivate the troops to get the job done. Arnold Toynbee, an English historian, said, apathy can only be overcome by enthusiasm. And enthusiasm can only be aroused by two things. First, an idea which takes imaginations by storm. And second, a definite, intelligible plan for carrying that idea into practice. Remember, he's got to build some enthusiasm. The people are in a state of disgrace. Add that to the rebuilding of the walls and that it had been attempted before and the people are going, yeah, right, Um, we can't do this, but he's getting them on board. They may have been thinking, who is this guy anyway? Who does he think he is? We've tried and we have failed. Now, Nehemiah could have whipped out his letter and said, well, I'm the governor and the king sent me and I had this official edict and yada, yada, yada. But a wise leader gathers the facts first. uh, First, a side note that James Boyce said that this account that Nehemiah gives us in chapter two and then we'll see in chapter three um, is an account that is so detailed that it is the best historical record of the extent of the city of uh, after the exile. So this is an area where theologians look back to see the lay of the land. Now, if he had reacted too quickly without getting the information and having a well-devised plan, they would have written him off as some dreamer, some guy that's just, you know, pie in the sky. Instead, he was wisely motivating the people. He cast a vision. He said, See the trouble we are in? Come, let us rebuild the wall so that we will no longer be in disgrace. Like who doesn't want to follow a leader like that? Um, And we can do that too. You can do that with your family. Hey kids, if we get all this done, we'll go get ice cream. Or your staff, if we can get the reports done, then I'll give you guys the day off tomorrow. So Nehemiah motivated the people with wisdom and tact and also with plain truth. He didn't circumvent um, or sugarcoat the way, the ruin that they found themselves in. And we have to be careful too, that when we're presenting something to someone that we don't uh, err by telling it like it is without any sensitivity or tact, but Nehemiah had both. And then boom, just like that, what did the people say? They said, let us start rebuilding. So they began the work. Why did they begin this work? And why were they so willing to respond? Like he did with King Artaxerxes, he saw this group as demoralized Jews. He appeals to them on a personal level, but he puts himself on the same level with them that that they are. We'll learn in chapter five that King Artaxerxes had actually appointed him as governor, but he did not lord that over the people he identified with them instead. And who doesn't love a superior who is willing to get on our level? Um, I've had a wonderful boss like that in my life. Somebody who has humility and they're a team player and it's not the us versus them mentality. Plus, Nehemiah made it clear that the fact um, all his uh, his success was given to the Lord. He was not a glory thief. Nehemiah did not take any glory for himself. 
And I'm sure there's a lot more here that's not recorded. He probably told them all about the king and um, how he provided all that he needed and the letters and uh, everything. And that just continued to further convince the people that this was actually a work of the Lord. And then here, what happens? Here come the troublemakers. And what usually happens to us as Christians when we begin to do a good work for the Lord in walks the opposition. Whenever anybody says, I will arise and build, what does Satan say? I will arise and oppose is what we usually find. It seems like we can always count on that. But as we saw in Ephesians 3, God has provisions for us that far outweigh the opposition that we face if we trust him with it. He can do abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. So it says in verse 19, when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Jeshem the Arab heard about it, what did they do? They mocked and they ridiculed him. What is this guy doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And have you ever experienced in anything like that? The Lord has laid something on your heart and faith and you step out to serve him in a particular place or maybe a project and maybe somebody's ridiculed you. Maybe they've said, she'll never make it. Who does she think she is, Wonder Woman? Maybe some in your family or even your friends ridicule your religious convictions, especially if you are working hard to live a more godly lifestyle. It often comes, um, it will often threaten other people because when they bump up against Jesus and he's working and doing something in your life, it can be a threat. God wants to begin a good work in each of us or when God wants to begin a good work, Satan will often oppose it. And I want that to be an encouragement to you though, when you step out to restore or rebuild or change something in your life and you encounter that opposition, that's a good thing because you know that the enemy is coming against you. So the enemy mocked and ridiculed Jesus the same way. It's the same tactic that he uses for us today. And Jesus, though, he came to restore us. And if you are a believer, you belong to him. And he wants to loosen that grip that the devil wants to have on you. He calls us to freedom. And we need to remember that, that we are not as believers enslaved anymore to our past, whether it's fear or drugs or alcohol or sex or pornography. I want you to picture Nehemiah with his fist raised when he says, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. He probably wanted to say a few more things, but he didn't. He left it at that. He keeps, he keeps a cool head, and he just states the facts. But these knuckleheads, they knew that he wasn't rebelling against the king because he had given them the letters. What do we call this? Psychological warfare. They were bullies, ladies. These were Old Testament bullies. They weren't happy because they didn't want anybody in charge but them. And Nehemiah, he was a threat to their leadership because he was the official governor. He was doing official business and he had the backing of the king. A jealous enemy is a dangerous enemy. Sometimes opposition can come in the form of envy from those that simply don't wanna see you succeed. They don't want to lose that corner of authority that they believe that they have. Their little kingdom of one is being threatened. And so they just come against you to oppose you. Ray Steadman points out that there are steps to our recovery and rebuilding and our restoration. And first, it begins just like Nehemiah did with a deep concern that leads us to prayer This gives us that desire for change. And the second thing is an opportunity to change that we have to actually step into. And finally, facing the facts of the situation honestly and squarely. Nehemiah never went into the work ahead of him naively. He knew it wasn't gonna be easy. That's why he went and walked the land to get a lay of the land and see the destruction in the first place. He was ready to face the challenges and even the opposition. And anytime we begin that work, there's always gonna be opposition. 
As we'll see in the coming chapters, opposition comes from the inside as well as the outside, from the Jewish people that are rebuilding the walls, as well as these guys that will continually show up to be a source of um, opposition to him. But the byproduct of that opposition when we face that in our lives is that it humbles us and it keeps us on our knees and it keeps us depending on God. Nehemiah wanted to make sure from the very get-go though that the people knew that it was God who was gonna give them success. I imagine some of those people were listening as he was addressing those troublemakers. So my question to you is who or what are you depending on to have success in your life? Where are you holding back from moving forward because you think it all depends on you? And how are you not trusting God to equip you? If God brings you to it, he will also bring you through it. And my prayer um, is that Nehemiah, my prayer is that Nehemiah is moving you from a place of complacency to action from conviction to prayerfully considering where God is calling you away from what is convenient, familiar, to uh, trust him, to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or imagine. So the last thing I'm going to close with on my way this morning, um, this song came on and I listened to the words and I thought, I have to share this with them this morning. And this is, requires glasses. It was a song called, uh, it was by King and Country. It's called Burn the Ships. How did you get here? All cast away on a lonely shore. I can see in your eyes, dear, it's hard to take for a moment more. We've got to burn the ship cut the ties, send a flare into the night, say a prayer, turn the tide, dry your tears and wave goodbye. Step into a new day. We can rise up from the dust and walk away. We can dance upon our heartache. Yes, so light a match, leave the past, burn the ships and don't look back. Don't let it arrest you. This fear is fear of falling again, just like the um, Israelites. And if you need a refuge, I will be right here with you until the end. And that's what God is saying to each of us. I don't know what you're facing in your life. I don't know what God's calling you to, but I know that he's faithful and that he'll see you through it, no matter what it is. Let me pray for us.